Hello, welcome back again. We are looking at distributed database management systems and uh, we more specifically look at the concepts, designs and transparencies. So the first thing we're going to uh, discuss is the distributed uh, database, the nature of a database being distributed. The idea is that this particular database is shared across a computer network. Now, since it's shared across a computer network then definitely that implies that there is a need for us to have a database management system that can can be able to handle such kind of operations where data is physically distributed across the entire network now uh, we talk of collection of logical uh, related shared data that's basically what a distributed database system will do and then, then there is the splitting of this data into fragments. Uh, basically, it's more like you pick a table and then you can be able to subdivide it into different parts based on the needs of different, uh, uh, different departments that you have in an organization. Or it can basically just be the whole, uh, the whole database system that you are able to split it based on uh, maybe the tables that would be applicable for different kind of departments. Now these these fragments can be replicated especially where they are being shared and therefore sites linked by they need to be linked by communication networks to allow different uh sectors or departments to be able to share that data if it has been distributed so data at each site is under the control of database management system and remember these are database management system that has the capacity to handle the concept of distribution and in that particular uh, organization it will be able to operate autonomously now we have this kind of uh, diagram that shows us basically what we mean by a distributed database system now if you look at it we have uh, all these uh, nodes are connected through a computer network we have site one which is connected to its own database site uh, site two site four connected to uh, its own database now basically what happens is that we might be having the same kind of data in all these sites or that is where we are we have replicated this particular kind of data or we can have a situation whereby it's one complete database system or each site can be a department or can be a sector but the entire database is split based on their needs so if we are in site number four and we require to access data that might at that particular moment not be in our database, uh, we can be able to source it from site number A. So we have, uh, we can have a centralized database that can also be accessed over a network. We can have site one, site four, accessing the, the resources from uh, uh, site two where we have the database. Now. There is what we refer to as parallel database management system and designed to execute operations in parallel. So when you're talking of uh, executing operations in parallel, basically we're looking at it from the perspective where we have in two different uh, or two, two alternative operations running at the same time when we could have one run, but now we have in uh, several that are running uh, at the same time. So this is based on the premise that single processor system can no longer meet the requirements for cost effective scalability and therefore reliability and performance is a key thing that we need to be looking at smaller in their nature we do not expect them to have enough uh, resources to be able maybe to handle a huge amount of tasks and therefore through that kind of linkage then uh, they can be able to get the resources that they require from the other computers that they are linked to now we look at the parallel database management system from the perspective of shared memory. Shared memory, just as the name suggests, is where we are going to be sharing memory in a, in a networked environment. We can have one machine or uh, having the memory and then all others can be able to use memory from that one machine. Then we have shared disk. Every computer will have maybe its own memory everything else except the disk we can share the disk then we can have the shared nothing where each maybe each site has its own uh, resources the, the, basically there's no sharing of resources here we have a diagram to show what we are saying here we have uh, site a let's assume this is our site a 
site A which is shared memory and then we have site B which is shared disk and then we have the one of the bottom here is the shared nothing. If you look at site A we have memory uh, separated from the computer system. The CPUs are the computer system. The cylinders are the, are the disks. So if you look at this scenario we only have one memory in this uh, network setup. In site B, we have every computer has its own memory, but they are sharing the the disks. The cylinders are basically the uh, uh, the disks we are talking about. If you look at the site number C here, I mean, yeah, site number C here. Basically, what we have in is in this network setup, every computer has its own memory. It has its own disks, so it does not need to share. So they are it's more of no sharing of resources in this particular kind of setup. What are the advantages of database management system? First, it can reflect the organizational structure. That is, if you have different departments based on the number of departments, you can be able to distribute database as such and reflecting your organization. We can have improved shareability and local autonomy. If we like if you look at the example of shared nothing where the the setup is not sharing anything we can have a lot of autonomy when it comes to processing of the data that we have in that particular local database or we can have a scenario whereby if the data is not available then it can be sourced from another site and improving on shareability we have improved availability that is available can be accessed from whichever site then there is also reliability should one site be able to be unable to perform well then data can always be fetched from the other site because the whole of it you need to look at it as one single database though it is shared among different sites there are economies of scale of course and then it becomes easier for you to be able to add another site that you might want to add and what modular growth is possible uh, limitations here would be it's complex to come up with such kind of setup you need the person with the right skills to be able to set it up cost of course is going to go up because now each site will be having its own resources and then security is another thing that you must be able to consider especially if we have different sites and each site uh, store is storing part of the database then if one site is compromised then it becomes an issue uh, consider that or uh, compare that with a situation whereby we have uh, the database in one central location and then we can focus our efforts of securing that data from that one single location so uh, integrity control is also more difficult because now you have uh, users from different sites who now might be having uh, different access control rights and all that so managing all that can be uh, a problem there could be also lack of standards especially when uh, even the hardwares the the softwares that you're using are of different uh, uh, they are of from different vendors and all that all the procedures that you are running different departments are completely I mean different sites are completely different then there would be lack of uh, standards and also lack of the experience it's not enough experience has been there. It's, a, it's an environment that keeps on improving. Database designs are also more complex, as we've said from the beginning of that first point when we talked of uh, complexity. The database must be designed with that in mind. Setting up the, the whole uh, distributed uh, database management system, it's a complex uh, kind of setup. Now we have different types of distributed database management system. We have heterogeneous and then we have uh, homogeneous. When you're talking of homogeneous is basically uh, probably uh, it's a setup where we are probably using the same vendors uh, tools or softwares if you like and even the hardware. Heterogeneous is a different scenario where you could have uh, tools from different vendors and uh, multi database uh, system the MDBS for you to be able to maintain a uh, complete autonomy this would mean that the database management system would first of all be transparent among the existing database and file systems and should allow users to access and share data without requiring physical database integration that is even the users themselves are not aware that they're using a different they have their own local 
local access to a database. Now what are the functions of a distributed database system? Since now we understand what a distributed database management system is, we need to look at it based on what kind of functions it can be able to offer. It can be able to extend communication service. Uh, if you consider two different departments and all that, we can also be able to extend our data dictionary where we have complete definition of the kind of, the, kind of data that we have in that particular database. Also distributed query processing can also be handled. Remember, query processing we saw from the beginning that it's a process that has to do from that particular uh, moment you give a query to the database up to where it is checked for its statistics to know whether it's going to cost a lot for it to be executed as it is to a point whereby a query can be optimized and then finally executed so we can have the whole of that process uh, distributed then we have concurrency control is another thing that is key especially now that you you are you are in an environment where transactions are being generated and we can also be able to extend uh, the recovery services. You can, in, in fact, on a distributed database system, you can be able to recover much more easier because most of the data that we wish to recover is only is is sometimes available in another site or in another location, and therefore that makes recovery much more easier. Now we have a reference architecture for a database management uh, system that is the distributed one. And uh, these reference architecture, basically it means that uh, somebody had to come up uh, or an organization had to come up with an architecture that you will have to follow if you are designing a distributed database management system. And there, if you look at this uh, reference architecture, it will be able to specify how you set global external schemas, global conceptual schemas. And remember, schemas are basically in the relationship of tables, how tables in the database are related to one another and all that, then uh, fragmentation schemas and allocation schemas, how basically you are able to implement that concept of fragmentation. If you fragment, basically if you subdivide a database, then and how does it uh, serve your business requirements and all that. Also setting up of schemas for each local uh, database management system that would conform to three level ANSI or SPAC. I believe that's the organization that has come up with this uh, reference architecture for distributed database management system. So it's more like offering a guide on how you can be able to do it step by step. So some levels may be missing depending on the level of transparency that is supported and also uh, depending also on the needs of your organization based on the requirements of your organization using that particular guide. So the reference uh, architecture is more of a guide that you must or that you should be able to follow. Now look at what we have. It shows you basically what you are going to have to follow. Like when you're talking of global external schemas, where we expect them to be and how they are interrelated. And you can have many of them. Then we can have a fragmentation schema, how it is uh, assigned to allocation schema. And finally, how you can have probably different sites all map into one based on, the, on this particular data that you've been able to to fragment in a distributed environment. Like if you look at site one, we have local mapping of that particular schema, and it also comes with the local conceptual schema and the local internal schema. And finally, we have the data itself at the bottom there. So each site can have such kind of mapping, and you can have as many sites as you choose to have. But one thing is that these mappings are the ones that are able to link from one site to another site based on the data that is required at that particular moment. Again, uh, the same concept that is being uh, the same concept that is being explained here, we have the global external schemas and then we have the global conceptual schema, which is more like a glue holding them all together. So if you require data and you're in one site and it's not within that particular site, then there will be there will be information on where that data can be found. It is on which station or it is on which site and then it can easily be accessed. Like if you look at most organizations that have a large network where databases have to be stored uh, 
have to be fragmented into different sites. You can be on one site, but you do not have the data that you require in that particular site. So how you access it or how the computer system, I mean the database management system will be able to know how to locate that data or where it is and how it can be updated. It is to the global conceptual schema information that is found there, which works in hand in hand with the local external schema. Now the distributed database uh, design under distributed database design, we look at three key issues. We have fragmentation. Relation may be divided into number of sub-relations, which are then distributed. Now, remember when we're talking of relations, we are basically referring to tables. Then we have the issue of allocation. Each fragment is stored at a site with at optimal distribution. You place it in a site where it is really needed. Then we have the replication itself. Uh, to replicate is basically just make a copy of the same thing. So a copy of the fragment may be maintained at several different sites. And if it is in different sites, then it means if you have a copy of a particular fragment in site one, and we have another copy also of the same fragment in site B. So even in site one, you access the local copy. And that makes the whole process much more faster and much more efficient. And remember when updates are made to the data that are in these particular fragments, remember the same uh, update must be replicated to all other fragments. Locality of reference, that is you can access from that particular location, improve reliability and, av and availability. So you already have your own copy within that particular site. So that's what you can, you are, you're going to always be able to access. Should it be unavailable, you can always access that data from another another site. There's also improved performance because it, you can access it quite, quite closer than the performance of access. I mean, the speed of access improves and the performance and also balanced uh, storage capacity and cost and all that. So we don't have one site being overwhelmed by the amount of uh, query requests to access a particular data uh, data object. Access can be done from your local site. Now we have also minimum communication costs since we are not sending a lot of requests across the entire network then you can see the traffic that moves from one net one site to another is able to reduce and we are able to minimize on communication costs. Quantitative information can later be used for us to be able to know whether uh, a particular fragment that we have in a particular site is serving its purpose well or perhaps maybe if we were to move it to another site then it can be, I mean the whole the whole network can be much more efficient and all that. So basically we, may, we just make use of all that information. And we also have the qualitative information that may include uh, transactions that are executed by an application, types of access that are done. Are we having more reads? Are we having more writes and all that? So that way you are able to make a good decision, especially if you are a database administrator based on how this data is shared and all that. Data allocation, we have four alternatives. We're looking at centralized partition, and then we have a complete replica, and then selective replica. If it is centralized, it is in one central location. Every, every user in that particular organization has to access data from that single location. Or we can have it partitioned. And these are basically the fragments that we were talking about. Different sites having a fragment that serves them better. Or we can have a complete replica where we, have, we, have, we pick the entire database and then we make a copy of the same data to different sites. And that's a complete replica. Or we can just selectively make a few uh, copies uh, based on different usage or requirements in different sites. Now, besides that, we have what refer to as methods of performing replication. How do you how do you decide to replicate a database? Do you just sit and just decide let's do A, B, and C, or is there an approach that can be able to achieve? Uh, what you want much more easier and much uh, in, a, in a much more organized way. We have snapshot replica because a snapshot is more of an image, an image of the database. That's what we are referring to as the snapshot itself. Then we have margin and replication. 
basically you need to have proper resources you need to such as uh, storage space and all that if you are merging two different databases into one and then you need to have uh, to check on consistencies to ensure that there, there is data consistency between the, the two kind of databases that you are merging. We have also transactional replica where users obtain a complete initial copies of the database and then obtain periodic updates. As data changes, then all those different sites will have to uh, make updates to those sites so that we can ensure that there is also consistency. Remember, one thing about database, system, database systems is to ensure that there is a, a consistency. If data in one site does not match the data on another site, then there is an issue. Now, we, have, uh, we can compare these uh, different strategies that we are talking about. Uh, like if you look on the first column here, we are having a centralized fragment. Now, uh, locality of reference is lowest here on centralized, fragmented is very high because if you fragment, you take it closer to a site. A complete replica can be achieved through, uh, through locality of reference and then we can have selective replica where again locality of reference can also be very high. So we have complete replica being very high, reliability and availability among these four that we have in here, which one is much more reliable, much more uh, available, then you can see that we have complete replica becomes much more reliable. Uh, when you look at it from the perspective of performance, what we have now, centralized is not satisfactory and this could be as a result of the fact that we are having every user or every site every user in every site accessing from one central location and that is where the problem might be now uh, satisfactory we have fragmented and also selective replica uh, storage cost we have the highest cost uh, when it comes to storage, we have the complete replica because if you do a complete replica, remember you're copying the whole thing and that would might might be very costly when it comes to storage. So you might need hardware with enough storage capacity and uh, communication costs, you can see the highest is centralized. And this is as a result of the fact that we have uh, this particular database in a single location. So the traffic is very high from every site sending its own request. So it becomes too high. But if you look at the uh, fragmented and low costs, since we have copies at site, then traffic, uh, that is the communication cost becomes very low. For complete replica, we say high for updates, low for reads, because uh, the only time maybe we would have uh, traffic uh, increases when the updates are being done because you make you make you make update to a data that is locally within your site then that update must be replicated to other uh, replicas that we have in different sites so why, why do we need to fragment now we might need to fragment for purpose of usage we have a database with information and the information there or that the data there is required by users from different sites. Hence, usage stands up as one of the key reasons why we have to perform uh, fragmentation. Now, applications work with views rather than entire relation. Now, remember, you, we use in SQL, you can be able to create views. And remember views, when you're talking of views, and if a table has like maybe six columns, you can create a view of like two columns of that particular database. I mean, of that particular table, because that might be what is required by uh, site A. Site, site two or site B might be requiring maybe three columns from that particular table. Then we have site C. Site C might be requiring maybe the entire relation or the entire table. So. Uh, for site A and site B, you create views and that becomes much more easier and data can be shared much more easily. So we have efficiency is another thing. Data is stored close to where it is most frequently used. If you have a fragment that bears data on maybe, maybe we have the finance department and then we have the hostel department. So uh, data that concerns uh, finance, we store it closer to the finance department. The one that concerns hostel information, then we store it in near the hostel 
uh, department so that's basically how you fragment and things becomes much become much more easier i mean accessing data becomes much more easier now parallelism we said a transaction is autonomous and must be performed to the completion even though we are going to have to subdivide into different queries so it becomes a transaction once it has been fully uh, fully completed and committed that's one thing you must also be able to remember uh, security we've seen that if we store data in a central location it's much more secure but there is a need for us to be able to share data there is a need for us to bring this data closer to different sites and therefore data is not required by local application is not stored in that particular location so it's not available to unauthorized users and therefore if we cannot provide security at a centralized location then we, the only other alternative is to ensure that we provide this security based on different sites and ensure that data that will not be required by that will be required by other sites is not available there so that once we lock we lock it down there then we can secure it and we can leave it for access to those users within that particular site hence we'll have now much more security again the disadvantages will be on performance and integrity remember we, at the beginning we said for distributed database systems sometimes it's difficult for you to be able to ensure there is integrity now you can look at integrity from the perspective of who makes changes to this particular data recording also what was changed and all that but if we have data that is even coming or updates that are coming from different sites might not be easier for you to be able to track all that and also performance uh, you just have to choose whichever method that brings proper performance in in a particular site and we have just seen that uh, all approaches have their own uh, limitations and they have their own advantages so when you are choosing the approach to use then you must be able to consider what kind of performance do you want because each will have its own performance as we have seen from the table we have just previously seen now correctness of fragments we have three correctness rules that is we must talk about completeness reconstruction and disjointness now completeness in relation is decomposed into fragments the area can represent different fragments as many as you have so each data uh, that can be found in r must appear in at least one fragment and that is the completeness that we are talking about when we are talking of reconstruction it must be possible to define a relation operation that will construct r from the fragments that is a relation we're looking at a relation as a table a complete table but this complete table we have subdivided it into different parts based on requirements from different uh, sites and therefore we we are saying we should be able to reconstruct the original uh, the original relation without any issue if you cannot reconstruct the uh, the original relation then there is a problem so reconstruction for horizontal fragments is union operation and and joined for vertical see if you're looking at a table from the perspective of horizontal now again we are talking of the records themselves if you're looking at it from the perspective of uh, vertical then we are looking at the attributes that form this particular table this jointness we are trying as much as we can to ensure that there is uh, consistency in this particular database if it appears in several other places then you, you might end up having uh, inconsistency issues because should the data be updated in one location then how do you guarantee it's updated in the other location so the, the key thing is to ensure that this particular data is in one site and can be accessed there it can be updated there so that's how that issue comes in so we have uh, four types of fragments horizontal vertical mixed and derived so those are the ones that we have i think we have a diagram here that can show us what we are talking about when you're talking of horizontal so you can see the the sections that we have uh that are that are that are in color we are talking of these are horizontal 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 and then we have the verticals and i've said if you're talking of horizontal you are basically talking about what 
uh, you are talking we are looking at it from the side of tuples that we have in a relation if you're looking at it from the perspective of vertical then we are looking at the attributes that would form this particular uh, this particular uh, relation so like in a we can have three we can have three fragments top fragment that is the middle fragment and then the bottom fragment there so all these can be distributed in different sites meaning if we are to collect this data back again from all these sites then we form the original uh, the original relation now b again we are we are fragmenting based on what uh, attributes the column the column we are looking at it from the perspective of columns so this one relation and we have divided it into three columns and we can have all those columns distributed to different sites we have mixed this is where you mix all of them vertical horizontal and this is based on the kind of needs that you are you are you are trying to the kind of needs that you're trying to satisfy from different sites now if you look at horizontal fragments would consist of subsets of tuples of a relation now we use these symbols to be able to define this this from a relational algebra if you look at it from the this is the complete tuple that we are looking at now now we can have it can be partitioned like here we have partition one and we have partition two now we can partition based on house we can partition based on uh the flat that is property for rent these these are relation for uh these are these these are relation you need to look at it from the perspective of a table so we can partition it as such now the horizontal fragment as we say this strategy is determined by looking at the predicates used by the transaction see it will involve finding the set of minimum complete and relevant predicates the ones that are relevant to a particular site you must open that relation look at it and see what will be able to what what is relevant for each and every site so that becomes that is that is it is important for you to consider that because that would mean that then that other application from whichever department it is it needs its own different kind of uh, different kind of data to service that particular section now uh, vertical remember vertical now we are looking at, uh, at this data from the perspective of the attributes or the columns now so in relational algebra this is basically the symbol that we use now here we have uh, staff number position now remember we said the one that is in brackets here is the relation itself so this is a table staff table so we're looking at it from staff number position sex this should be the date of birth and then salary so that is one again you're looking at another uh, another view from staff number that has staff number first name last name and branch number that is the second one now that means that s could be satisfying only a particular site and that's what that is all they require from this particular uh, staff table and therefore you can create a view for that and then we can have uh, s1 could be for another kind of site that is only requiring staff number position sex date of birth and salary and therefore you create a view for that particular uh, up that particular site using the staff relation now mix fragment as you can see here from the relational algebra we are mixing them all of them you are looking at it from the perspective of a row you again looking at it from the perspective of uh, the columns and therefore it's possible for you to be able to uh, select uh, select or select attributes or select columns from a, a table and at the same time be able to specify exactly which uh, uh, which data for it's for which particular records because you know in a data in a table we identify data based on unique identifiers such as primary key so you can select specific you can give specific requirements are you looking for records with particular uh, uh, primary keys or are you looking for are you going to categorize based on example if 
you need uh, records that only be go be belong to the male students or only belong to the female students or male or female employees, whichever category that you're going to use. So we can be able to create a partition that we have picked from an original table, but you have only picked just several columns and then several records, not all of them. So that allows us to now be able to come up with a mixed fragment that we are talking about. Here we have another example here. Uh, site to an S21, S22, S23, all of them they are making use of what? Uh, the same S2 relation. That is we have we have S1 and then we have S2. S1 represents staff number, first name, last name and then we have branch number. And it's picked from this particular relation that we are referring to as staff. But now we can have S1 that is only picking from this S2. But what are they picking? They are only picking uh, staff number, I mean branch number, those employees that are of a branch number that is indicated as B003. We can have another view where we are picking for those employees that are only of staff a branch number B005 and so on. So at the end of it, from the original table, we are able to create views and from those views, we are able to get our fragments and from those fragments, we are able to even get other fragments to serve different departments or different sectors. Now we have derived horizontal fragments. So a horizontal fragment that is based on horizontal fragment of a parent relation. Now look at what we have done here. If we go back here, so S21, we are able to get it from S2. Now remember S2, we got it from the original relation. So that's basically what we are trying to say. Now if relation would contain more than one foreign key needed to select one as a parent. Remember we said that foreign key is basically uh, in one relation is a primary key, but now it is in another relation and in that particular relation, it's not the primary key, but it's just one of other non-key attributes. We cannot, okay, sorry, we cannot call it a non-key attribute, but it's not the primary key, but it is in another, in another relation. So in that other relation, it becomes a foreign key. So uh, choose that is choice can be based on fragment used most frequently or fragmented with better joins. So we can be able to join those two relations and we are able to get uh, another fragment or another view of that particular data. Now distributed database design methodology. So we have a methodology that is provided for us to be able to follow. Use normal methodology to produce a design for the global relations. You saw like when we're looking at the distributed database uh, reference architecture. So there are methodologies that are also provided. Also you need to examine the topology of the system to determine whether where databases will be located. Also analyze most important transactions and identify appropriateness. Now you're going to identify these appropriateness based on what? Based on different sites. Uh, site A, what do they require? Site B, what do they require? And so on. So you can look at it from the perspective of the kind of records they require. Maybe we only require employees belonging to a particular department. You can create a fragment of that data and allocate it to a particular site or probably you just require um, uh, attributes of a relations that would serve the purpose of a particular uh, site. So decide also which relations are not to be fragmented. Uh, this could be for security purpose, maybe it's the kind of data that's not accessed frequently and so on, so you may decide there is no need to fragment. Examine relations on one side of relationship and determine suitable fragment schemas that you're going to have to follow. Now we have transparencies in distributed database uh, management system, we have distributed transparency and we look at it from fragment transparency. Now, if you talk of transparency is where now as a user of that particular database, you will never be able to notice whether you are just using a fragment of the entire database. That's how we look at transparency from that particular perspective. 
naming transparency each item in database must have a unique name and that is basically what now will ensure there is consistency in a database we wouldn't want one item to have uh, uh, different names so if that is there then that means that updates might not be done correctly uh, what else is there still on naming so we said items should have a unique name that way we can have proper updates transaction ensure that all distributed transactions maintain distributed database integrity consistency very key example distributed transaction now if it is a distributed transaction t prints out names of all staffs using schema defined above s1 s2 21 22 and 23 so we can define three uh, sub transactions and it means these it is one big transaction but we have uh, divided it into different uh, sub transactions remember we said uh, a transaction is more like a job but within it we have different tasks that have to be performed so these are like the different tasks that form the entire transaction so if we have at time one we can begin with uh, we can begin with the one for schema three we can begin transaction here we can also begin transaction there and begin transaction on s7 so we can read data read data read data then we have print and then print and print at the end of it all what is happening it's a one single transaction which needs to be if successful then we end the transaction but as you can see we are operating with different what uh, different uh, schemas we are able to access this data from different schemas but remember these are sub these are sub uh, sub transactions now concurrency again what we've said it's important to ensure that all data items have a unique name and that is what will bring about that is unique unique labeling or unique names that's what would bring about the transparency that we are talking about so all transaction must execute independently because it is an autonomous a transaction is an is is autonomous in in nature so some fundamental principles for centralized database system must be able to consider that a uh, distributed database management system must ensure both global and local transactions do not interfere with each other each transaction stands on its own and does not depend on any other transaction for each to be implemented similarly distributed database management system must ensure consistency of all sub transactions of global transaction and uh, the one distributed will be within the local site now here we have an example given here uh, if you look at site a we have sql query where we are selecting all from staff where uh, salary greater than 20. if you look at this we have an update that is down here we have an up update staff set salary is equals to salary mot multiplied by the original plus an additional that is we have 1.05 so that that's a could be a promotion of some sort then update property for rent then you can set what you can set that amount for rent and then you commit once you commit a transaction that is it now on the side of b what are we having updates update staff set salary is equal salary multiply by that and then you update that and then you're able to make an increment so again you commit that you are able to commit that so it's the same thing that is happening so we have different transactions that are happening in different uh on different tables because now this one is requesting for update to property so here we're making to use of two different tables we have salary and then we have property the same applies to down here we have salary and then we have property so but this one is not making use of another table it's only making use of a single table so access comes something that is quite easier and uh, uh, it's easier and efficient and even much more faster and this transaction can be easily man managed without any issue now 
and concurrency transparency we say update must be propagated to all sites as we have been saying you update on one site then make sure that the same kind of data uh, the, the same kind of information is updated on all other sites and this is what will ensure that there is consistency because it's very important for us to be able to have what to have uh, con consistency in a database so other trans concurrency transparency could limit update prog propagation to only those sites currently available so remaining sites update when they become available so that's that's number one thing that is very unique about this distributed database management system if it is not available it will still be able to do that update whenever that particular site becomes available though you notice that there is some kind of delay and we're saying the there is delay in regaining consistency and it might be for a few seconds and so on and that is basically the nature with distributed systems there is a little bit of delay now under failure we look at it from the perspective where first of all you must understand that a transaction is autonomous and should be durable it becomes durable once we do the commit process remember we said uh, the sub transactions are the activities that we have within the original transaction so if any of them should fail then we do not have a transaction at all even though sub transaction one might have been successful sub transaction two might have been successful but if sub transaction three is not successful then that calls for a bot of the entire process we can be able to say there is a durability if they've all been able to execute to the end and then we have committed so that's a very important step that we must be able to consider a uh, distributed database management system must perform as if there were a centralized distributed database management system and that is why we are talking of what having the transparency transparency basically implies that you cannot notice as a user if there is any difference it should operate as though you're operating uh, a distributed data or a database management system that is centrally located so that's the reason why we talk of transparencies especially with distributed systems users should not be able to notice those kind of difference and we can cover those differences by ensuring there is proper performance by ensuring the whole setup is very uh, efficient now we have distributed query processor that would map data requests into into ordered sequence of operation on local databases we must be able to consider uh, fragments replication and allocated schema once you do that then we have the performance uh, to a level of you the user being able to maybe feel that get or getting the feeling that you are using a database management system that is from a central location so that's basically what can be able to cover for those uh, little limitations here and there so we look at input and output costs and we also look at the cpu costs and then the communication costs and that's why you saw that some techniques would cause a lot of traffic in the entire network and if traffic increases then cost of communication also increases so we we count this cost of communication based on the amount of time or the amount of data that we are going to carry along this particular uh this particular networked environment so input output cost we basically looking at what uh how long does it take to get uh uh, to get instructions from a particular input device or to get it out to a particular output device how long does it take cpu cost how long does it take to process such and such an amount of data uh, performance transparency example here here we have property uh, these basically are relations we have property relation client uh, relation viewing and then basically what we have and we have uh, property number client number prop number now these are basically uh, unique ways for us to be able to access data like if you look at viewing this can be a view that we have created we can create a view and we can create a view using uh, 
property relation and we can also create a view using the client relation if you're going to look at viewing then what you can notice from viewing is that it bears the primary key and the from property and primary key from relation so accessing viewing should be able to allow you to access all data from property and all data from client so that is one way of linking the two relations together now we have sql statement here where i'm assuming p now stands for property and that's why we have prop number so we select from property here it's an alias of property relation we can do an inner join where we can be able to get what uh, uh, client C, we have we have relation client, and then in a join again, viewing V on where this is basically where uh, uh, this primary key matches the primary key that we have in in client and the one that is that we have in in viewing ends V C and V. So these are alias to represent those particular table on where prop 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 number would be equal to prop number that is under property and also under where under the view again where p dot city that is property and then the city there is an attribute within that particular that property relation that's for city so where that column for city is equals to aberdeen and in client table where the maximum price column would have a value that is greater than two hundred thousand. yeah so it's able to generate the kind of uh data or pick the kind of data you want from all these kind of relations using such an example so performance transparency again having this example we can say each tuple in each relation is 100 characters long 10 renders with maximum uh, price greater than 200,000 and then we have 100,000 viewings for property in Aberdeen and then computation time negligible compared to the communication time. So after having executed this SQL then you can make this conclusion. So computation time is negligible meaning that it will not cost us a lot to be able to perform such kind of transaction. Because now we are looking at it from the perspectives where we are these are basically different views that we've been having i mean different fragments of the same database that we have probably in different what different sites and so on so here again we're seeing comparison of distributed uh, query uh, processing strategy now the strategy is in move client relation to london process and query there so if this relation, this relation that we are referring to as client was within that particular location called London, then this would be the time that it would take. If you are to move property and view in relation to Glasgow site, then this would be the amount of time it would take for such a query. If we join property and view in relation at London and select tuple for Aberdeen properties and for each of these in turn, we can check at Glasgow to determine if associated whether we have a maximum price of 200,000 and that will take 2.3 days to be able to complete that. So you can basically you're getting an idea of what I'm saying based on these uh, having different uh, different fragments uh, strategically stored at particular sites. So you have to be able to consider that you have to be able to consider the need of a particular site before you can decide uh, let me have this fragment here and there here and there so fragments are based on the need of a particular site before you can uh, decide to come up with a fragment always make sure first you've understood the need of that particular site. so having said that i think this marks the end of this class so see you next time